All right, good late after morning, everyone. My name is Duncan DeVore, and I'm going to talk today about the idea of managing state in a consistent manner and dealing with identity that needs to be composed in the, the terms of microservices. I'm not a huge fan of the word microservice, um, but as we get through the slides, you'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, ultimately, it's going to come down to distributed computing. As always with all the presentations, um, please rate the session when you're done. Obviously, give this one five stars. So uh, just kidding. Now, give it what you actually think. And uh, if you have any comments or feedback afterwards, please, please come talk to me. Um, so I work for Lightbend. Uh, many, of you, many of you know us. Uh, for those that don't, we have a variety of open source uh, offerings, toolkits, uh, ACA, Play, Legome, et cetera. Um, aside from giving away those things for free, we also do some consulting. And we have some commercial aspects to our stack under our enterprise suite, or here you see it called the production suite. And in there we offer things like telemetry, um, monitoring uh, type stuff. We also offer split brain resolver for clustering. We also have um, a new area that we're real excited about, and that's our fast data architecture with uh, AI and so forth. So uh, this all comes with a subscription uh, to our services, and they're at varying you know, levels of, of, of price and so forth. But some really good stuff. Uh, you know, go to our website, check it out when you get a chance. For myself, I've been an engineer for a long time. I've been with Lightband, formerly TypeSafe, for about three years. The bulk of that time has been uh, as an engineer working on telemetry and monitoring. Recently, uh, I've been working a little bit more with the customer side of things as, uh, as an architect. Uh, I have a book out there with two other, work, uh, two other authors, Sean Walsh and Brian Hanafy. It's Reactive Application Design. And it's all kind of the same thing, talks about this. That's my Twitter and my GitHub account, if you're interested for some stuff out there. And this will all be in the slides, so you all have access to it. So I want to talk about microservices, only because that's the hot term. That's the term people are talking about. For me, it doesn't really matter what you, can call, what you call it. You can call it modules. You can call it balloons. It doesn't really matter to me. It's basically a concept. Um, and over the last 20 years or so, we've been uh, building applications of what has been coined or termed as a monolith. And in that uh, environment, we've been able to rely on things like strong consistency. We've been able to rely on a, a pseudo global state of now in that environment. And we've been able to rely on you know, um, transactional rollbacks and things like this. And the reality of it is, is, is as our landscape has changed, that model is beginning to crumble. It's beginning to fail. It's no longer working. Yes, it does work in some circumstances. But as we talk about this and we see, we're going to take a deep look at some of the different things that are going on and why we need to embrace a new way to think about things, specifically when it comes to the important things of our application, uh, consistent state and um, composable identity. Gartner put out this statement in referring to essentially monolithic type applications. And, and they said the traditional architectures that we're used for or, or, or used to are obsolete. What's interesting about this statement is that when they put it out, they were stating as of the time that they put the statement out, which I think was 2016, uh, those platforms are already obsolete. We have new challenges today. Mobile, uh, you know, I use an app called Expensify. I use it on mobile and I use it on the web and, and all this stuff. And I want the same stuff to show up in my web version as I do in my mobile version. We have the Internet of Things. We have uh, deployments that are using thousands of cores, right? Kind of stuff that we never dreamed of 10, 15 years ago. Users, what's really interesting, are expecting the same type of response time that mission critical applications expected 10 or 15 years ago. When you take a look at NASA and you take a look at energy and how the grid works, we had something that we called near real time or real time data processing, extremely important. That's now becoming standard for your average application as an expectation from the user. Um, uptime, they're expecting 100% uptime. It's just, it's like uh, your TV remote, right? What would you do without it? 
Uh, and even that, right? People aren't even using TV anymore. They're using Netflix and Hulu and all these different kinds of things. So the idea is the traditional methods for building applications are starting to fall apart at various levels. Um, uh, a good analogy is if you are a, um, a transportation company or a moving company and you built your business on horse and wagon, when the automobile was invented, obviously your first reaction is, the horse and wagon is a tried and true way to do things. My whole establishment is set up to handle that. My deployment mechanisms, my supply chain, all of it, right? This new automobile thing, it's too much of a change, right? Or I don't need it. But as time goes on and your competitors start to embrace it, they begin to outpace you. And you get to be put into a position where you're like, okay, I'm in trouble here. You know, I've added 16 extra horses and wagons to my uh, moving company, but it's just not cutting it. These trucks can hold more, they can move faster, they can go longer. And so we have to think about um, how we're going to handle that and what we're going to do. You know, my horses get sick, I've got to shoe them. There's all kinds of problems with an expanded fleet of horses that you are beginning to incur that perhaps you didn't when you were a smaller company. And so the idea here is, is we don't need more horses or better wagons. We need an entirely different way to do things. We need an automobile. And I'm analogizing that to the monolith. So I will tell you it's time to retire that way of thinking and embrace a new way of thinking, embrace a new way to address these, these challenges that we're facing. So using the word microservice, because we don't have any better word to use, um, one definition, and I think many of us are familiar with this, some of the advantages of it, is it supports a multiple team or a multiple autonomous teams. It gives you the ability to scale development, uh, deploy independently, and so forth. Those are all great things. They're powerful. You have one team, they can work uh, in some degree isolation and be able to work on their thing without affecting another team. And that's very powerful. However, that's more from an organizational or a developmental uh, structure. What I want to talk to you today is the idea of microservices and what I believe to be their, their true context, and that's distributed computing or, or distributed systems, and, and how the idea of microservices gives you the ability to embrace and understand that model. Um, so a definition that I prefer is a system of autonomous, collaborative, distributed services. A system of autonomous, collaborative, distributed services. Um, the idea is, is you'll see two words that are, are highlighted there, system and autonomous, and they're key aspects of understanding this. The first part is autonomy, and it comes from a Greek word, autonomous, right? Auto meaning self, and nomos meaning law. So you can kind of see where this is going. An entity within a particular microsystem or microservice gives oneself its own laws. It's self-governing. This is important, right? It gives the uh, entity, the ability to be free from the ba uh, uh, boundaries or free from the content of external influences. In other words, external influences no longer have, author or have authority over those uh, individual services. So you can make decisions independently. You can act independently. You can coordinate and cooperate and work together collaboratively to solve other problems. This brings us to this idea of something called promise theory, which I think is really neat. It's a real fascinating thing, and it's the way the world works, except in, in computer science. Um, and the idea, this gentleman, Mark Burgess, he, he wrote about this, and it's basically the understanding of an autonomous system and how it works in a collaborative environment. So in DevOps, this is, has become relatively popular, but there's a lot of great things here that I think can help us in computer science, especially in the area of building dis uh, distributed systems. So when you're thinking about, and this all ties into state management, which we'll see shortly, and, and ultimately composable identity. But when you're thinking about building a system, uh, a particular microservice, you want to begin to think in the idea of, or in the, in the realm of promises rather than obligations. You want to think, hey, um, there is a way I'm going to present myself and I'm going to say, hey, I'm capable of doing certain things. This is what I promise to this collaborative organization, uh, what I'm going to do. This is my role. This is how I'm going to approach it. The opposite, obviously, is obligations, where someone external obligates you or imposes their will upon you, and that will in a distributed system is imposed across distributed boundaries, and that begins to cause all ki kinds of problems. 
It uh, causes problems uh, majority around performance. It also bases your ability to perform or your behavior um, on someone else's ability to deliver, and that is not good. Just like we know concrete contractual agreements and distributed systems are not good, the, uh, the fact that your service is relying on another service to deliver, and if it doesn't deliver, your service fails, is, is not a good thing. So in the idea of autonomy, you take control, you have control, the information that you need is local, you have control over that information. Obligations, like I said on the flip side, uh, is the inverse of that, and we lose control. And we base our ability to, um, uh, to do our job on the performance of someone else. Promises, they start out by expressing an intent about where I want to go, right? An endpoint, what you want to happen, what the ultimate outcome should be. And that is independent of your current status. Okay, so if I say, if I promise to somebody I'm going to meet them for lunch in an hour, that's independent of what I'm doing right now. That's my ultimate outcome. Obligations, on the other hand, are be someone dictating to me what I'm going to do. They define a, a, a starting point. And the problem with that is because they're not within my, my boundaries. They're not within my world, my reality. Their obligation is specific to where they happen to be at the moment that they obligate me to do that, and when they impose it on me. So it's, there's both time and geographic constrictions that get applied when you're obligating things, right? So things change, relative, things are relative depending on where you're standing. We know that from physics. So that's the challenges. And what happens is, is uh, promises have a tendency to lead you towards convergence where obligations end up leading you towards divergence, right? Convergence out of physics it leads us to a fixed point. A stable system is what we're going after, right? Where divergence does the opposite. It leads us to instability. Obligations diverge because they diverge into unpredictable incomes. While they start out with a definitive beginning, I, person A, expect person B to be at lunch at 1230, that's pretty definitive. Um, because you can't control the environment, you can barely control the environment you're in, let alone someone else's environment, right? And as a result, things begin to happen. Uh, maybe the person gets sick or, or they get an important call or things begin to change. So going from a certain state to an uncertain state is what occurs when you have obligations. And your, your system begins to diverge, leading to um, instability in the system. Whereas with a promise, if I say I'm going to be at lunch, unless it's a catastrophic emergency that I have to cancel, I'm going to be at lunch. Right? That's the promise I made. Um, while where I'm at when I make the promise is not necessarily definitive, currently I'm giving a, a presentation, um, the fact that I'll be at lunch at, at 1.30 or whatever is, is pretty solid. So it leads the system from an uh, undefined outcome to a more defined outcome, and the result of this is improved uh, stability and, and, and uh, certainty of how your system works. In layman's terms, we call it idempotence, where you have two systems that are separated, and one system needs to communicate with another system. The idea is if I've already received that communication and I've processed it and I'm satisfied with my processing, then I can do nothing. And this gets into a discussion which I'm not going to go into detail in this presentation, but the idea of guaranteed message delivery and things like that in, in message-based systems. Um, I like this tweet um, by Mary. Promises are not guarantees. Guarantees are not possible. And this is especially true when we get into complex systems um, like uh, distributed systems. So an autonomous service can uh, promise its own behavior, but that's all it can do, right? It can only promise its own behavior. And when you begin to think about this idea and you begin to read about it, this, it's a fundamental yet simple concept. It's the way you live your life for the most part. Yes, many of us make promises we can't keep, we overwork, we take on too much responsibility, but we all recognize that as an error. And as we mature and we begin to identify our boundaries and set constraints on what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do, we move towards a position of more certainty and more stability in our life. It's the same thing with uh, uh, computer science, same type of system. Um, it has a profound impact on how you build these systems. 
What ends up happening is it gives you all the information that you need locally to resolve conflict, to repair under failure, what we call self-healing, to be available, be consistent within yourself, right? It removes the need for extraneous communication and coordination because it's just not realistic across distributed boundaries. There's no guarantee. We have latency. We have all kinds of issues that we need to think about. Um, and this, this idea behind all of this leads us to this notion of state management and consistent state management. Right? What is it? What is it? It sounds like a problem. And it is a problem, right? Um, in monoliths, we're spoiled a little bit because we kind of have this like uh, fantasy land where we can have you know, transactions that we can roll back and sequential processing and, and you know, a, a single database that everyone uses and so forth. And the reality of it is, is as we move into this new landscape, the ability for that solution to solve our problems is, is going by the wayside. It ends up becoming a fairy tale. Um, the idea of strong consistency. And, and think about it a second. We talk about strong consistency a lot. If, if, if banks, right, banks, financial institutions, if, um, if strong consistency is like a commandment, I have to have it, then why do we have overdraft fees? That should never happen if I'm strongly consistent, right? Why do we have back order on inventory? It should never happen. We're strongly consistent. We use the super database. And, um, but that's how the real world works. So why do we try to enforce our systems to, to act in a way that uh, the real world doesn't work? I like this slide as the elephant in the room, consistent state. We talk about mutable state and how it can be dangerous in distributed systems. It's are we ignoring something that's important, state management, right? In a distributed system, it has to be managed differently than you do it in a monolith. And not only that, are we not only ignoring the elephant, but do we see the same elephant becomes the question. So state management, what, what, what is it? One definition is uh, stateful means computer or a program that keeps track of state and interaction, usually by setting a value in a storage field designated by that pur or for that purpose. And I think that's a, a, a reasonable definition. Um, kind of like in conjunction with that, we have different mediums in which we can store state. It can be hot, warm, cold. They, these can be broken down even further. You know, basically your hot is in memory, your warm is disk, and cold is archiving or off-site a lot of times. What's interesting is the volume of data that's processable um, increases, or the volume of data that is stored decreases as you go up, but the performance increases as you go up. So it's much faster to store uh, uh, state in hot memory, but the volume of data you can store in hot memory is generally less than what you would store in cold memory, just as a side note. Um, but regardless of what storage medium you use, the thing that you have to realize, especially when you're looking across distributed boundaries, is you are always looking at something from the past. The state that you are viewing you are always listening or you're always reviewing something from the past. And that's why it's dangerous to be ob obligated because the state information that an external system gives you may be erroneous by the time that you process it. And you are going to respond to an obligation of which the obligation has changed unbeknownst to you and due to latency or due to whatever reason, you have not been updated for that new, new obligation. So, this becomes an issue. Understanding this can be both terrifying and liberating, right? The fact that we can uh, be in a position where the data that we received is somewhat unreliable because it's historical um, in, in the sense if we're trying to make a decision about now, that can be a little scary. But it's also an environment um, that tells us that there's some exciting things that can happen in this environment, this environment of distributed computing. Um, it shatters this illusion that we strive for, this global state of now, that despite um, where anyone comes into our application, they're all going to see the same result, which simply is it's, it's not a reality. There's a great cost of trying to maintain that with both uh, Amdo and, and, and Gunter. Right? Amdo basically said the effect on trying to maintain this type of illusion, especially in parallel systems, is... The contention for resources gives us diminishing returns regardless of how many additional processors uh, or concurrent, uh, uh, concurrent processes you add in. Gunter took it a step further and he said it also adds coherency. In other words, the value of the, of the response or the data you're getting back is also 
uh, depreciated as well and can have negative effects. So by trying to enforce that idea in our design of our applications and our systems, um, we have this, this idea where as latency gets um, greater within a distributed system, that illusion of a global state of now begins to crack more and more and more. So Pat Helen, if you've heard of him, great guy, um, he made a statement, in a distributed system, you can know where work is done or you can know when work is done, but you can't know both. You can know where it's done, you can know when it's done, but you can't know both. These are certain realities that we just have to deal with. We have to accept. We want to change them. Um, we want to, as a programmer, it's my environment. I will make it work. But yeah, you can make it work in isolation, but once you do composability, uh, that, that uh, ability breaks down. And so that leads us to you know, a storm in building these types of applications in a distributed environment. Once you begin to exit that safety or that that little uh, bounded area of your microservice, you enter this wild, wild west, this wild ocean of non-determinism in what we call distributed systems, the in-between area, where things can fail fantastically uh, and you don't understand or necessarily know why um, in intricate ways, all kinds of crazy things. Information can get lost, it can get garbled, it can get restructured because things are happening outside of your control. And while that all sounds very scary and terrifying, the reality of it is it's also the same world that gives us the ability to be resilient. It gives us the ability to be re elastic. It gives us the ability to scale independently. It gives us the ability for us to do our job even though someone else may not be able to do their job. And uh, gives us the ability to isolate and so forth. So there's positives and there's negatives. And a lot of times we try to push the, the negatives away, but we need to embrace them and understand them. So as we apply the positives, self-healing, resiliency, elasticity, and so forth, we do it correctly and confidently. Um, what a microservice ends up doing in this type of environment for us is it gives us like island we can work in. In our microservice itself, we can simulate some of the monolithic behavior. If there are aspects that need strong consistency, we can implement that if need be. Um, we can kind of create uh, an illusion uh, where things are working properly and our view of now is current um, and, and have that safety. And that, that works great with testing, right? Fantastic way of testing. But we need to accept the responsibility of our own data. We need to take responsibility for it and control it. Again, another thing Pat says, outside data or inside data is our current present. That's our view of reality, right? Um, uh, outside data is a blast from the past because it's like looking at stars, right? You look at a star and that's 10,000 light years ago or whatever, right? We accept that normally, but when we get into comp sci, we try to change that. And then in between, right, the in-between services is hope for the future. It's just like when I'm talking to a person. Um, they promised me they're going to meet me at lunch at X time, and that's my hope, right? I cross that distributed boundary, phone call, email, what have you. Um, and so as a result, what we propose is that you, in a microservice, in this, this new design, that you own your state exclusively, right? The left, you see a monolith using a shared database. On the right, you see each individual microservice having their own database. That breaks some principles that we grew up on, right? Normalization. Data is not redundant. If you're a CQRS fan, on the query side, there's literally tons of duplicated data, right? And that's okay. That's okay. Some of the things that we learned that have been drilled into our head as, as uh, horrible things are actually not horrible at all in a distributed environment. Your microservice should own its own data. The other fallacy like I, I like to put out is there's no such thing as a stateless architecture. And I see this quite a bit. Oh, this is going to be stateless. This is going to be stateless. I'm going to stick Kafka in between. Or I'm going to have a database, uh, you know, keep my state management or whatever. The reality of it is, is it's still not stateless. You're just pushing the state management off to somebody else. You're pushing it off to a queue, you're pushing it off to a database, you're pushing it off to a shared resource, who, who knows what. But somebody else is still managing that state and you have to pay the penalty to hydrate it and dehydrate it when you're in, uh, exiting and, and entering your system. It makes it harder to control, right? And um, the integrity, it, it makes it harder for you to have integrity guarantees, it makes scalability difficult, 
are more difficult. It makes availability difficult. Um, so I would argue that you should take control of your own state and manage it yourself. Does that mean you shouldn't use a database or queue? No, not at all. But there's a lot of places where you can manage hot state in memory and give wonderful answers. You can manage duplicate data on the query side for SecureS and give instant answers, et cetera. And to achieve this again, uh, we'll talk a little bit about domain-driven design, but you have this idea of consistent boundaries. You want to identify what your behavior is, what your data is. One of the best ways to look at this is take a look at your data first, how the data interacts, try to understand the data structures, uh, figure out what the SLAs are, the integrity guarantees of the data, and what the business needs. Um, begin to try to minimize your data sets, and then you can take a look at what needs to be strongly consistent, what doesn't need to be strongly consistent, and then you can kind of begin to layer behavior over top of this process, and all of a sudden you begin to materialize of what a potential microservice might be. Um, again, as I had mentioned earlier, bounded context from uh, domain-driven design. Uh, it's really kind of like distributed domain-driven design, but you're going to define a specific domain within a bounded context. I think the example that Eric, one of the examples that Eric uses in his book that I think is really good is an invoice to one bounded context is not necessarily the same thing to another bounded context. So you can have an invoice object in accounts receivable and an in invoice object in sales or something. They can be two separate objects. They may share a lot of the same kind of data, but that's okay. You need to protect yourself against the other services and the problems that they can cause. Um, so how do we manage this stuff? Well, eventual consistency. Uh, don't be surprised. It's how the world works. Everything is eventually consistent. Overdrafts, back order. There are some stronger guarantees and consistency models, such as causal consistency and so forth. And there are other ways that you can uh, explore to tighten things up a little bit. Um, we have ACA distributed data, which is a, essentially a hot, um, memory model that allows you to very quickly with an algebraic structure replicate data across nodes so whatever node you come in you see the same thing. Um, but ultimately eventual consistency is the understay of all this. Rather than rejecting it, embrace it, accept it, it's how you live your life, right? Understand it, understand how it works in computer science. In the perfect world, I'd love to have strong consistency everywhere like instantaneous, right? But it just is not reality, right? By embracing a term like, or embracing eventual consistency, you're able to do things like raise the ceiling of the performance of your application. You're able to loosely couple things. You're able to scale things now. You've broken those dependencies on other systems. You've pulled your versioning down into your microservices, and you're now able to do things. And when you say your test runs and it passes, you know for a fact that your service is working. If the Node.js front end is having some strange problems and not projecting uh, the correct information, you know it's not your service, it's somewhere in between because your test says that your service is working properly, right? You wrote your, your, your test as a headless service. This whole idea about CAP theorem, um, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance and distributed systems. Eventual consistency is a key tenet which hel helps us do this. Now, this all leads us to this idea of identity, composing, uh, composable identity, the meaning of life. At the end of the day, we have a, a system that repre is represented, a distributed system that is represented by a whole bunch of, of different microservices <clears throat> that are an identity, and that identity is composable and tiered at multi multiple levels. Gmail has an identity. It's called Gmail. It's an email service. But there's also many different identities within Gmail. There's advertisement identities. There's user identities. People who use G e Gmail, in, in a sense, are their own identity, and so forth. And these things are important because that's the projection that the customer sees. At some form, at some level, the customer sees identity. So how do we achieve things like uh, this composable identity? Well, one of the things is, is just like um, polyglot programming, polyglot consistence. The idea, again, a microservice, use whatever storage medium works best for your service. One service, it might be Cassandra. Another service, it might be Mongo. Another service, it might be Kafka, whatever. Another service, it may be just hot memory. Um, it all depends on the business. It depends on what the business needs are um, <clears throat> in determining how that service should operate. So use what fits. You're basically decentralizing data management 
uh, and uh, you're, you're using this idea of, of, of polyglot persistence. Uh, again, Pat Helen says the truth is the log. The database is a, uh, a cache of a subset of the log. And so his thing is, is why are we using databases where we do normalization and abstract all this data over multiple levels when we can just get access to the real data itself? Right? So what does he mean by that? You know, he says the log is the truth. To me, this is the easiest example by, by all means. It's a canonical example of an event log. It's, it's a ledger. It's how your bank does your checkbook, hopefully, your checking account or your savings account. You have debits and you have credits. They don't update current state. When you make a deposit, they don't change your balance in, in the classical sense uh, and overwrite what it is, right? They add a new line entry and then they derive the balance. Now, they may have an algorithm that derives the balance every time a new entry is made just for optimization, but ultimately they have this event store that's append only. The debit or the credit is added on. <clears throat> so to explain this, I like to use this example of a crud versus a, uh, a reactive shopping cart. Uh, I call it event sourcing here, but the crud shopping. This is a crud shopping cart. Create, read, update, and delete. Um, just Due to the, the lack of time, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but you can see what's going on here. Uh, eight things occur. We have four items added, shipping, a total is generated, uh, inserted into the order and the order line, and uh, then at some point, point in the future before that order is actually um, begun to be fulfilled, the customer logs back in and says, you know what, that, that fourth item or that second item, I don't want it, so I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to update my order. So what ends up happening is the order line deletes that row. It's no longer part of the, part of the order, and everything gets readjusted. The balance is now $47. And so this is kind of what we have at the end. We have the order. We have the total. And in our order item, order item or order line, we have three rows, which represent the orders, and we have shipping information stored in another table. Now your manager comes along, and he says, look, there's a particular item that's not selling very well. We're not really sure. Um, it could be customers are removing it from the carts or whatever. I want you to generate a report for me, and I want that report to show me every time a customer deletes this particular type of item from the cart. And so what's your answer to them? I can't do that. But here's what I can do for you. We'll start a new sprint. We'll add audit logging. We'll use Hibernate and VARES. We'll track that, items that are deleted from shopping carts. We'll push that out in the next deployment, and you'll have what you want. Sounds great, right? Well, first of all, you've got to devote a, probably a sprint to it, Hibernate and Bears, or whatever you're using for audit logging. And the reality of it is, it's only from that point forward that it's deployed that you're able to provide that information. All that other historical data you have is lost. There's no way for you to derive that information. And that's a substantial impact on business. That's how static state models and ORMs work, right? They're good, they work, but they come at a large cost. They, they maintain current state. Your domain's tightly coupled to the model. You have to deal with leaky abstractions. You have to deal with um, anemic domain models. And ultimately, the intent of the user, the purpose of how they're using the system is lost because you're only capturing current state. Um, essentially, the way they work is they represent, there's a good thing about them, they represent a change between two points, which we call a delta. And the back end manages this. The deltas are implicit. And the ORM updates the backing model by calculating diffs and working through the, the, the convergence problems. And then ultimately, it ends up getting stored into the database. Um, auditing is always has to be explicit in most cases. Now, this is a reactive shopping cart, right? A little bit more beefy. And we're going to go back to our example here. Real quickly, what are events? I'm sure many of you are familiar. They're basically notifications that something has occurred. Uh, they cannot be rejected because they're a historical recording. Uh, an example would be client registered, client locale changed. We go back to our example. It's the same thing, except for the very last bullet, or uh, item number, number eight, where it says 123, the event stream is inserted. Now, you can insert these as a stream. You can do it as an individual event, one after another. However, but ultimately, what we come up with is this. We have a sequence of writes, append onlys, one after another, that identify behavior in the form of events which get persisted to the database. Now your manager comes back and asks you the same problem. 
are leading up to that. Uh, the customer comes in and deletes the item, and this is what happens. It now gets added or appended to the log as a new event. Nothing is deleted. Just a new event is stored in the log that says the customer deleted this item out of the shopping cart. So what you can begin to see is if you begin to play this back, you can compose current state at various parts through the, the historical stream of events that are persisted. At any point, you, you can begin to observe behavior. Oh, wow, that's interesting. This person deleted it after it was in the shopping cart for 30 seconds, but this person deleted it in the shopping cart after it was there for five minutes. Who knows what that means, right? But it could mean something. Um, and you're able to derive current state by replaying these events, or for optimization purposes, you can snapshot current state that you have in hot memory and so forth. We can talk about that afterwards if you have questions. Um, the data is not pers uh, uh, persisted um, structurally. It's persisted as a series of events, and there's no coupling between the domain model and uh, the, the database model. So the technology implications, it's additive architecture. Right? And it's beautiful for distributing. It's an append only key, it's some kind of hash. There's no complicated key, there's no locks or fewer locks. Uh, horizontal partitioning and relational databases can be difficult because of the complexity of keys. And this model, it's very, very simple. <clears throat> and with an event store, you know, you basically have one hash key, which makes it real easy to shard. The business implications, you're tracking. Uh, from inception, uh, depending on the granularity of your event model, uh, what's happening in stream, so you're capturing behavior. You're able to answer questions from the origin of the system, and you're able to answer questions that have potentially not yet been asked, because you have this extra data that you can analyze and take a look at. And it also gives you a natural audit log. Pat Helen has a great paper, um, Life Beyond Distributed Transactions and Apostate Opinion. I highly recommend reading it. We can talk offline, but uh, I'm not a big fan of, of transactions. To a certain degree, yes, uh, but the notion of you know, these uh, distributed transactions and stuff um, and all the ch challenges and issues. So, But anyways, great paper, I would read it. And so this is what we end up with. This is the reality that we deal with. We deal with it in life, and this is the system that we ultimately will strive to build. In life, state yields identity, right? Um, the example I like to say is, let's say I'm a rugby player, and at the current time, my, my state is healthy, and I'm going to go play a rug. I'm going to go play rugby. I'm going to be a rug, rugby player. But on the way to the rugby game, I get into a car accident, and I get damaged, right? What happens is my my state has been changed. I broke my arm, okay? As a result of that state change, my identity has now also changed. I have become a patient. I am no longer a rugby player. These are the realities of life. These are the realities of building systems. I have to be able to, within my own bounded context, in my own isolated instance, call my coach and say, I broke my arm. You need to stick Johnny in as a replacement. We have just now self-healed the team. And I'm able to, with my new identity, go to the hospital and get my arm fixed and continue to work and maybe come back and help coach until my arm heals. That's life. That's reality. That's how we need to build systems today. And then the big box, system composable identity, it's all those little microservices that represent that, those concepts and that can be aggregated into one uh, global uh, view of what identity is, and it can also be uh, decomposed down into the individual states. So if you're one of those guys that loves composable futures, this is right up your alley. You can do this with actors and all that kind of stuff as well. So sorry for the rush. There's a lot to go through there. I hope at some level this was useful for you. Uh, I don't know if we have any time for questions. If we don't, um, feel free to come up and ask questions, and we can go from there.